and welcome everyone um, to day two of uh, Overcoming Barriers in an Innovation Event. Um, I am Brian Minster with RNN Architects um, in partnership with the um, Department of Housing and Urban Development and Housing Innovation Alliance. Uh, to host these uh, collaborative discussions in order to better understand and overcome barriers to high performance and innovation in the housing industry. Um, this two-day event is focused on four categories. Uh, day one, last Tuesday, panel discussion. One included education, understanding industry um, resources, availability, and value. Uh, panel discussion two on Tuesday was behavioral factors and biases, understanding industry habits, changing perspectives, and behavioral uh, modification to uh, champion innovation. Uh, today, day two, we begin our uh, third panel discussion on the topic risk, uh, mitigation failure, where value outweighs risk, and fourth and final panel discussion to immediate follow is uh, fragmentation of the industry, driving collaboration, integration for innovation. That's a tongue twister. Um, the panel uh, will start immediately following uh, my, my intro. Um, uh, the, the risk session begins is from noon to one, uh, immediately following um, that would be the fragmentation session at uh, 1.15 to 2. And uh, the breakout sessions, the working groups will uh, run concurrently uh, with each other for risk and fragmentation at 2.15 to 3 p.m. Um, the facilitator will lead the panel discussion with a series of questions for each of the panelists. Intent of the questions is to stimulate ideas and deeper thoughts and raise more questions for panel discussion and for those listening in. Uh, Betsy, I was wondering if you could uh, turn it over to you for speaking about the um, uh, other partnerships involved with this. Sure, sure. So after the panel discussions, um, as Brian mentioned, um, Sam Rubin is going to be facilitating this first panel, um, and you'll have the opportunity to provide questions here. And during the working groups later, you'll also be able to be live on camera and really be part of the discussion. So hopefully you can stick around for the two panels and also participate in the working group sessions. And um, we're excited to be hosting this event on behalf of RNN and the U.S. Uh, Department of Housing and Urban Development. Um, it is market uh, rate focused housing. Um, and uh, I just want to take the opportunity as the Alliance, we wouldn't be here as an organization to help host an event like this, as well as all of the other programming that we do to look at innovation in the housing space, if it weren't for our partners. So I just want to take a moment to thank our partners for their support. Um, their insights, uh, you actually see one of our partners in, uh, you're going to hear from uh, Scott from MyTech um, shortly, uh, but we wouldn't be here uh, and able to support something like this without their help um, and the insights that they bring. So thank you very much for uh, what you do for us. Uh, thanks, Betsy. And again, uh, as well, thanks to the partnership, RNN Architects would not be able to achieve um, HUD's vision on this project without, without, without everybody's participation. Um, we have a highly experienced panel facilitated by Sam Rubin, um, the Chief Sustainability Officer and co-founder of Mighty, um, a construction company, a technology company innovating the industry through 3D printing, house, house 3D printing housing. Uh, the, we're focused on uh, ensuring the value of innovation outweighs the exposure um, that could result from failure and activity. Mitigating the risk along the way is the primary focus of our discussions today. Um, 
how we uh, we want to encourage all uh, to provide input. Um, we'd like you to enter your comments and questions you might have throughout the session. You can click on um, uh, the chat function uh, at the bottom of your screen and type in your comment. And uh, please be sure uh, that uh, under the two item that everyone appears so that everybody can see your comments and questions. Again, I would like to say a sincere thank you for all volunteers and participants. And uh, I will now turn over the discussion uh, to our facilitator, um, Sam Rubin. Thank you so much, Brian and Betsy, for the great introduction and the great uh, overview of what we're going to be doing today. As mentioned, my name is Sam Rubin, and I'm the Chief Sustainability Officer and one of the co-founders of Mighty Buildings, uh, based here in uh, Oakland, California. And it's my distinct uh, pleasure to be uh, facilitating such a great panel today. So we've got Carolina Albano, a former consultant in product development and go-to-market strategies. She's host of the podcast Build Perspectives, and she's also VP of Rain Screens for Stocorp. We have Anthony Grisolia, who leads innovation programs for Bacos working with manufacturers to test existing products and to develop new products and markets. Bill Rectanus leads Thrive Home Builders High Performance Building Initiative and helps drive innovation throughout the organization. Scott Reichsenberger, a VP with MyTech who collaborates with production home builders to digitally enable their businesses and drive the adoption of offsite construction. And last but certainly not least, Chris Spelke, uh, who's with the Denver Housing Authority and is involved in all aspects of the development process, including community engagement, design, construction, and financial management. And to start things off, each of the panelists will be giving a quick five minute presentation. And with that, uh, Carolina Albano will be starting us. Thank you. Good morning, everyone from Southern California. And I'm gonna get right to it because I know we're limited on time. So the, I think public enemy number one to innovation today is the charged political climate that we're living in. And there seems to be an intolerance for the people who don't think like us. Uh, but in order, in order for innovation to happen, ideas really need a safe place to be heard. One of the most popular episodes that we had on Build Perspectives is the episode is titled, What If You Weren't Afraid to Get Fired? So in your organization, you know, what if you have like the next big idea, but the employees are afraid to share because they don't think it's going to be well received or they're afraid they're going to get fired. So I think number one, first and foremost is you got to, uh, give ideas a safe place to be heard. Decisions um, also cannot be made out of self-interest. Uh, there are studies that show that like for software developers, especially um, anytime you add self-interest to the mix as things are being developed and innovated, uh, that increases your risk of failure. So um, you gotta check your own self-interest at the door and the other important thing is you got to watch for the need for yourself to be right. So let go of the egos, make it a safe place to be heard. And that's a great place to start. Next. Next slide. There we go. All right. So an, a huge barrier to innovation is playing it safe. And as you get higher and higher in an organization and you've got investors and you've got stakeholders, it becomes really hard to justify the risk of innovation, but without risk, there's no reward and nothing in life really comes without risk. So why not innovate? There are ways that you can offset risk. Um, you start out with an intention. Why, why, why are we, what are we after? What's the end goal? What, what, what is the vision? Why are we innovating? Innovating for the sake of innovation, you know, also is, is not a great endeavor. So set an intention with your group, with the team and, and find out why, why is it that you wanna innovate? Then create a plan and a vision for what that future looks like. Then you set some milestones and some phases uh, for each of those steps. And others in this presentation will go and get into this a little bit in more detail. Um, but it, it, through each of those milestones and phases, um, you have to set time limits and dollars and you know, run this by your, your board of directors or whoever's overseeing this endeavor 
Um, and of course, plan for pivots and obstacles because they will happen. You gotta, if you plan for failure, you're gonna be able to learn from that. Um, remember, you know, Edison came up with, you know, 19 or whatever, 9,000 ways to not make a light bulb. So mm -hmm. failure is good because failure can be an indicator of, you know, what not to do. So um, again, don't play it safe because that's overcoming, um, overcoming failures is really, uh, what it's all about with innovation. Next slide. And finally, um, something that's very near and dear to my heart, uh, you've got to light the way for those coming in. Uh, we got to make it, especially in our industry, the construction industry, um, we're desperate for labor right now. And we've got to make it welcoming. We've got to make a welcome environment for Gen Z that's coming into the workforce right now. So in order for us to do that, we have to be willing to mentor the next generation, but also allow ourselves to be mentored by them because they're bringing in ideas. Yes, you may think they're crazy and you, you know, but try to like not say it'll never work. Uh, that's kind of like part of like the older that we get, you know, we used to criticize the people that would say that to us. Now we're the ones saying it. So check yourself when you're, when you think that'll never work. I remember the days when uh, my clients uh, didn't have email. Uh, so the construction industry tends to be kind of a late bloomer when it comes to technology. So let's make it a welcoming environment for those people that have those fresh ideas, all those people that are coming in and let's not be uh, final adopters of technology. Let's be new adopters, early adopters of technology. And we can do that by welcoming those who can reverse that trend for us. And that's it, that's all I got. Uh, Carolina, we have a question from uh, Jerry Bowen. Um, how quickly can you thumbs up or thumbs down an in innovation? Uh, does risk always lead to the discussion? That's a big question. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think it is. And actually, I think for the sake of time, maybe we can bring that back to the entire panel at the end. Yeah, um, I, I love that. I, I, think, I think Mike's make, make, makes sense just to make sure we get through everything and have okay. that robust discussion there. Okay. Um, but yeah, thank you so much, Carolina. The awesome, really excited, sparking some thinking here. Some great questions. I hopefully we'll tee up for you uh, in the panel at the end. And next we have uh, Anthony Grisolio with uh, Bacos. Awesome. Well, thanks for the invite. This is a cool opportunity to speak to a bunch of cool innovators and uh, really idealists in, the, in our industry. But uh, I have one slide here really describes how Ibicus as idea innovators think about the home building industry. And we have a process that we, we've developed called the Ibicus Innovation Pathway. And uh, as Ibicus, we have the privilege of seeing a lot of things in the home building industry, specifically new construction, large home builders. We have the privilege of being on a lot of their sites. So we see a lot of their challenges that they face from a, whether it's trade or a business or a technology. So we have the privilege of coming up with cool ideas um, as engineers, architects, building scientists. That's what we do on a day-to-day -day basis for idea people. So I'll go through each of there's basically three steps of our innovation pathway, explore and discover, develop and demonstrate, start up and deliver. And each one I'll, I'll pick out the key risk barrier that we see is should hi be highlighted in this conversation. So as you can see, um, from ideas to ventures, that's what we're all about. And you see there's a pathway where we have stakeholder values. So involving the key stakeholders from the initial concept is key. Uh, whether it's involving a builder or a potential manufacturer partner or a trade is key to seeing the evolution of a innovation develop. And it helps you as an innovator to come up with better strategies or you know, re, you know, turn to a certain angle to figure out what that solution is for specific questions. But in the explore and discover phase, I wanna highlight sort of our innovation principles, which if you can answer a lot of these principles or, or make uh, assumptions, you can sort of minimize risks along the way of, of the pathway to get to a venture launch. So really the key thing for us is making sure there's always a clear business value. And what I mean by that, there has to be something from a, a market perspective. If we're launching a venture, it has to be successful. If that venture cannot be successful financially, it's, it may not happen. Uh, so that's key. And then along the way, we look at product and process technologies. As Ibicus, we're always looking at technology to help the industry. So product and process is key for us. 
And in that process, we're always looking at what the market value of the concept or technology is, what is its performance value it's going to bring to whether it's the builder, the trade, or the house as a whole, what is the productivity value? And we know in the days, today's day where labor and, and is a challenge, productivity is key. We can actually help improve that with some key innovations. And then what's the economic value? I think you'll find you could have a great idea. It performs great, but it just costs too much to bring it into the industry. And then lastly, I think it's sort of the future value. We need to have a sustainability story. You know, carbon neutrality in the next 10 years is going to be really key. And, and a lot of big home builders have no clue what that means to them on a day-to-day -day business. So that's sort of the balance of what we look at in an explore and discover. And we have a, a thing that we say to all of my team is, how fast can we kill this idea? Because if we cannot kill the idea, that means we're going to have probably a good chance of success. So that's in the Explore and Discover. So the, the big key uh, barrier for us in that Explore and Discover, it's hard to get investment in that early phase. Early phase innovation, early stage innovation, it's hard. A lot of you know, traditional investors want to see what is this product? What's the ROI? You know, give me a pro forma to invest on. Well, we, sometimes you don't have that. And sometimes you have to look elsewhere for investment. And a lot of times we, as Ibicus, we look at the government. Government has opportunities for grants for early innovation ideas. So that's something as an innovator you may want to look at um, as potential early investment. So we go into develop and demonstrate some of the key things there that we always, this is, the, this is where the rubber meets the road for us. So we have to demonstrate the technology. So we're doing code approvals. We're validating time and motion studies if it's a technology that's going to get adopted in the field. Um, and this is where we're actually going to demonstrate. So we actually physically need to demonstrate the technology, what it means to the builder. And remember, along the way, we have builders and trades following us. So what we do in this case, we usually partner with a builder that's going to build a home with our technology in it, involve the trades, get the local building officials involved, get them aware of what the technology is and what it means to not only their innovation, their inspection process, but what do the trades have to do to meet the codes? So and that is, you know, if you can't get code approval at this point, that could potentially be a barrier. And this is sort of the key one here. If you can't get code approvals or it's going to take a long time, that's a barrier for uh, from an innovation standpoint. So if we can pass that go, no go decision and that develop and demonstrate, we got a solution. We demonstrate builders like it, trades like it, potential investors like it. Boom. Now we're into startup and delivery. And this is in my mind, uh, this is where shit can happen. Um, and this is, and I, in, in my discussion with Betsy uh, last week, I gave a little snapshot, but when we start up and deliver, we're, we're actually trying to get builders or trades to actually do this, not, not just once, but multiple times at a community scale. This is where key relationships come in. And in our, in my mind, this is the biggest risk because today traditional builders, large builders have really strong trade relationships where 15, 20 year relationships and big business accounts. So when you have an innovation, I give this an example all the time, let's call it uh, an enclosed wall assembly that's built off site that involves a lot of things, framing, insulation, weather resistant barrier, whatever it is, multiple technologies going into the market through the builder that technology actually creates relationship constraints, not just a framer, but an insulator, a house wrap guy, potentially stucco guys. So those relationships get compounded by the more things you integrate in a wall, which again, from a technology makes sense from a performance, sustainability, productivity. But if you can't overcome the relationship where the builder has to really, you know, butt heads with his relationship with the trade, say, hey, this product is actually going to reduce my productivity. I'm mean, improve my productivity, reduce the cost. Can you do this for me? And that's where the rubber meets the road from a, a barrier standpoint. Uh, so thank all you in so all, much, Anthony. Yeah, the last thought there, if you would. La last thought. That I know I could ramble on for 20 <laughs> minutes, but but that was it. You know, but the startup and the deliver. That's where, as Ibicus, we we move off. We're idea guy. We're intrinsic people. We need the extrinsic team to take it and launch it into the market. So that's a key thing for us, making sure you got the right team in place. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you so much for that, Anthony. And uh, next we have uh, Bill Rutanis with uh, Thrive Home Builders. Thanks, Sam. I appreciate that. Well, we've talked a little bit about uh, 
kind of the, the inspiration of innovation and the thought process of spurring innovation. Anthony did a great job of talking about the, the process of creating and delivering that, that innovation and spoke really well about the challenges of implementation in the field with the labor force. And I'm gonna kind of continue on with that, uh, with that thought process and really talk from the builder's perspective here real briefly to spur some thought on, on what it takes to actually implement that at the end of the line. And from a builder um, who's done this quite a bit, we look at three kind of big buckets uh, when we're trying to decide whether to move forward uh, with some innovative product or system solution. And that's installation, liability, and use and maintenance. And Anthony already started the conversation on installation because one of the most important aspects of installation is labor force. And this is where it becomes really challenging. A lot of innovation comes to the builder without a labor force attached. And they look to the builder to help create that labor force. And that's a challenge because I will tell you from my experience in doing innovation, that if you do not have a buy-in and excitement by the individuals in the field who are responsible for the installation or implementation of that innovation, and you don't create a good closed loop conversation between that crew, that installation partner, the builder, the supplier, and the innovative innovation partner, you have failure. You have a high degree of failure. If you have excitement and buy-in and you create that closed loop conversation, you have a high propensity for success because everyone is working together over the hurdles and the challenges that are likely to come when you're putting something new into a product. So labor becomes a very important conversation. You could probably talk about that one for an hour uh, because there are a lot of facets to it like Anthony was talking. The next for a builder is supply chain. Um, that's a big conversation in the market today. As you can imagine, builders today are having trouble getting the, the most basic of building materials from windows to doors, door locks, lumber is hard to get. And so to have innovation come to your door having a good understanding of that supply chain. How readily available is this innovation? How does it get to me? Through how many channels does it flow? Where can my vendor partner procure this innovative product or system solution? And then next is the building science piece of it. You know, we've worked really hard as, as innovative builders and, and good builders to create detailed scopes of works and specifications and detail packages to make sure that everything we're putting into the home, we put into the home without causing problems, that we're focused on managing moisture, humidity, vapor movement, comfort, all these things. So is this innovation supporting that and making it easier by reducing the number of steps? Or is that innovation creating a challenge and adding additional steps or fracturing that installation between a couple of vendors and thereby challenging the process. We have to be focused on if we're gonna put innovation into the home that we're, that we're not causing a problem at the same time and really focused on the building science aspect of that installation. The next big bucket is liability. And that, that building science piece flows right into the liability section. We wanna make sure that we're not increasing our risk of construction defect liability, having a problem down the road, whether it be from a building science issue or a code compliance issue. We wanna make sure we have that, you know, Anthony talked about code compliance and getting there first. That's really important to a builder. We have to make sure that we're not increasing our risk to a level that's, that's unmanageable or unacceptable for our business. The next step of that liability process is warranty. We have to provide a warranty for this innovative product. And typically that falls to our vendor partner to warranty that on our behalf for one year or two years or five years, depending on the product and what you're putting in. And are we at a point, have we created that buy-in? Have we created that communication, that closed loop conversation, that supply chain to give that vendor a high enough comfort level to be willing to stand behind this, in, this innovation and be the person on the front line backing it up? The next piece of that is the supply chain because we talked about supply chain in labor and sometimes it can be really easy to get the machine, the innovation, the, the, the package. But when it comes down to warranty and service, getting the parts, getting the materials, that's a completely different supply chain. And it's often ignored. And that's often where innovation can have real problems. It went in fine. And then we had warranty issues or we had supply chain issues and it became really hard to keep our buyers and our customers happy with that part of the process because that supply chain wasn't quite uh, up to snuff yet. The next piece is use and maintenance. And this is where we forget a lot. We're handing this home over, we're handing this innovation over to a homeowner that's gonna live with this innovation for five, 10, 20 years. 
we can't forget that piece of the puzzle. We have to be able to have a good conversation with our homeowner so that they understand the benefits of that innovation that they received, that we've set proper expectations to make sure that they understand the difference in their previous home to this home and whatever innovation that might be. If there's anything in use or operation that we have to keep an eye on. And then finally, they're gonna to have to maintain this. So making sure that they understand those maintenance requirements, is it homeowner maintenance, is it specialty contractor maintenance that they, that they have to um, procure? And then finally that supply chain hits again. Is, is, is there a supply chain for those, uh, those maintenance needs, those filters, those cleaners, whatever might be need for that innovative product. So these, when we're looking at innovation- Bill, we're, we're just about out of time. So yep. Yep. these are the three big buckets that we need to focus on together. Awesome. Thank you so much, Bill. Really appreciate that insight into how the builders are looking at it and really understanding kind of those, those three buckets. And it's interesting to hear the different pieces that pop up in each of them repeatedly, uh, kind mm -hmm. of give some areas for focus. Um, our next speaker is going to be uh, Scott Reichenberger with uh, MyTech. Floor is yours, Scott. So when we look at, and, and I agree with everything that's been said so far, when we look at uh, risks to uh, innovation, we look at you know, what are, what are the barriers to change? Um, uh, how, how do we move from working in our silos? Um, and those silos could be, uh, it could be the builder architect, it could be uh, the framer, uh, the, the HVAC designer, the um, uh, any of the MEP trades, uh, the component manufacturer, um, the, 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 the suppliers, uh, for home building, um, how do how do we get everybody from just working in their own world to work together and collaborate? And as as we look at the future, we look at things in a, a design and then a make build uh, perspective. So when we look at design, um, we can reduce waste and increase the value by optimizing processes, both on site and off site, and by moving decisions from the 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 physical world to the virtual world. So you're, you're really building it before you build it. And it all revolves around collaboration and, and having all of the players work together and understand where and when in the process they're gonna add value. Um, so when we think about design of a home, it's the design of the home, and, and how everybody fits and everybody should play a part in, in making that an efficient process. Betsy, can you go to the next slide? So when we look at the, the make phase of um, this process, we're thinking about, all right, um, how can we efficiently make these products? But we actually have to make these products and, and there's all sorts of innovative technology that's out there right now uh, in the forms of, of automated machinery. New, and they're not so new, they've been around a long time. If, if Jerry's on the phone he, or on the, the, the call, he'll be able to talk to you about you know, how long they've been doing floor cassettes over in Europe. Um, but taking that innovative technology and um, making that in a factory and then making it in a way that it can be assembled um, or built um, on the job site in an efficient manner. So again, it's gonna require collaboration between uh, if it happened to be the, 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 the floors or the roofs of the walls uh, between the framer. So the manufacturer of those components understands what order to ship those out in, okay? and what order they're, they're going to be installed in. And the framer has to be involved in that, that conversation. Um, HVAC, where's HVAC going to run through? Where's the plumbing going to run through the, 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 the home or the building? And knowing how that's going to go together, collaborating around that model, that, that, that virtual world, the BIM, is, is the, the, the right way to move forward with that. Betsy, can you go to the next slide? And then with, with that collaboration, um, it's, it's assembling those, those, those uh, pieces or building those, those components in the right order. 
But again, if it's simply a set of plans that go out to uh, a component manufacturer to build, and then the product shows up on the job site, and then uh, the, the framer figures out how to unstack, restack the product to put it together, um, there, there, there's a, we're, we're, we have a, a bunch of waste being introduced into the process. Likewise, the HVAC uh, installer shows up and uh, he's running uh, his product through the, the, the force system. And then the plumber shows up and uh, you, you've got collisions uh, within that system. They figure it out, but it takes time. Sometimes it's, it's not done right. And there, there's a lot of repairs and corrections, a lot of waste and time and, and materials that happen. So looking at things from that design, then make and then build on the job site becomes really important. And it doesn't happen without collaboration throughout that process. Wonderful, thank you so much, Scott. That was really, really great. Really appreciate that perspective and that really makes a lot of sense. I'll kind of bring it through and then what I'm hearing a lot and I'll be bringing this question to the, to the entire panel after Chris speaks here, but this idea of collaboration and finding the right partners and engagement seems to be something that's coming through really strongly. Um, and last presentation of the day is Chris Spelke with the uh, Denver Housing Authority. Thanks, Sam. Yeah, definitely it's having a great team, right? Just making sure we got that first slide of mine. There it is. Um, so just want a quick background also just to show, you know, what we're trying to do at Denver Housing Authority with, you know, this part of Denver, which is essentially the northwest quadrant of the city and county. And we're actually the second largest landowner outside of the city. Um, we got 6,000 total affordable units across the city and we're trying to add 1,300 new mixed affordable units here by 2024. And really a lot of what, what my job is, is, is looking this 1950s old low rise public housing stock. Um, and, you know, thinking about this innovative model that has been around for a while to leverage federal resources, local resources to deconcentrate poverty with a mixed income approach. And where we're fortunate around transit stations like Sun Valley and our Westridge homes that we've identified along light rail and um, close to downtown, we can triple that density, replace the public housing, very low income units, and more than double those income restricted units while also adding um, a third or 20% of non-income or attainable market. I think that's where we've been really successful and what we're, um, still challenged to do in, in a lot of the work we got ahead of, ahead of us here. Next slide, please. So I think for me, you know, in, in a lot of the themes we're talking about is giving a different perspective on DHA and how we try to balance project priorities and with limited budgets, right? And a big component starting off is obviously the need, the affordability. Um, and here for Sun Valley, this example is, you know, a larger family makeup and really replacing not only bedroom for, or unit for unit, but bedroom for bedroom. And that's why we're, you know, getting bigger size units and trying to stack those in an urban setting. Um, definitely comes with its challenges of getting that right social mix, right? Especially when you have folks that are, you know, below $10,000 a year in annual income and also trying to serve folks that are, you know, just barely getting by it, you know, making just around 40 to 50,000 a year. And, and, really being inclusive in that model and trying to do the highest and best use with land, right? Because land is, um, is very limited and we should be responsible in doing the highest and best use for that. But, you know, not to get into all of the, the things that DHA has really tried to perfect and listening, not only listening to the, the community and getting surveys, but really doing a, a full on health needs assessment, understanding, you know, the social determinants of health and how that, really plays into what the priorities for any given project are and what these grow healthy principles also feed into our enterprise green and building code requirements to still do innovative um, solutions. And, can add, and I can answer questions here, I know we're out of time, but um, one of the things that we're trying to expand is 
um, using condos to add this market component, but also have a larger range of affordable options for folks. Sorry, I'm get to that last slide here. I know I got like a minute. This was something I wanted to put together because my first project was a senior mid-rise project um, back in 2010. And I've done five of those. We just recently got priced. Um, that's going to get built here, hopefully by the end of 2022. And in that time, the construction timelines have doubled. I've had, went from 12 months, about over a hundred bucks a foot to now pushing 24, 26 months um, for the same product type. And I think that a lot of that that cost and and what that's taken away from ability to build more and build better is a lot due to regulation and from you know federal processes that we have to go through, but obviously everyone deals with you know building codes that's been talked about and just not only permitting, but also inspections and, and how can our industry really play a role in saying, you know, from the local to the national levels of help let us do our job and build quality efficient and affordable building solutions and obviously projects um, so we can help meet this need. And I think that that's one of my solutions that I propose and happy to take questions or have more conversation on that. 